I think Light and Darkness Dragon is the first proper boss monster in the game. One which saw not only success, but meta-shaking success. In a monarch-dominated metagame, Lad was arguably the only two-tribute monster worth playing, or at least one which could not be cheated out through other means. But I am getting ahead of myself. I want to point out a few precursor monsters which ultimately led to Lad, and to start to chip away at what constitutes a good boss monster, although I recognize the inherent subjectivity of this matter. I think the best place to begin is with setting out the two criteria I think are necessary for a monster to be considered a boss. The first of which is some degree of difficulty in bringing the monster out, and the second is the monster's raw power or the impact of its effects. Technically, we can consider the original Blue-Eyes White Dragon as the first ever boss monster, as it was a true tribute monster, which would be a minus two in terms of card advantage. Of course, this could be circumvented with either Monster Reborn or Flute of Summoning Dragon, which I consider to be cheating it out. On the power side of the evaluation, Blue-Eyes has unsurpassed stats for a normal monster, but the actual impact of the card is little more than an imposing stat block. This also applies to the Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon, which is difficult when fusion summoning, but relatively easy to bring out with Cyberstein after that card was branded. Undoubtedly, these are high-tempo plays, which demand a response from the opponent, but when the response is as general as Fisher, there is a bit of a problem. I feel like a good boss monster needs to have some degree of inherent protection. There is a cliche, dies to removal, but this is true, and ultimately boils back down to card economy. If you are investing multiple cards into your boss monster, your opponent should also have to invest multiple cards to deal with it, so you don't fall too far behind in terms of card advantage. Later on, there is a trio of fusion monsters with Dark Balter the Terrible, Fiend Skull Dragon, and Ryu Senshi, each of which has a bit of inherent protection. Dark Balter can negate normal spells at the cost of a thousand life points, and the effect of effect monsters it destroys by battle. Fiend Skull Dragon negates the effects of flip effect monsters, which might actually need some problem solving card text, like with Royal Command, to specify if it's just the flip effects or the other type of effects that the monster would have. The other effect is more straightforward, being negation of targeting traps which target the dragon specifically. Then, Ryu Senshi is the Dragon Warrior, who is also able to negate normal traps for 1000 life points, as well as any spell which targets Ryu Senshi. This trio of monsters is interesting, since each one has partial immunity while also offering good board presence. From a balance perspective, unfortunately Metamorphosis greatly decreases the barrier to summoning these monsters, which extends to a couple other fusion monsters in the era. Thousand Eyes Restrict is the first fusion monster to hit the FNL list, mainly for that battle phase dominance, although the removal effect is also very nice. Of course, Metamorphosis is still the greatest enabler, and in all honesty is the design limiting card, but I want to take a second to point out Relinquished, one of the materials for Thousand Eyes Restrict. And that monster is potentially boss material, since it has solid removal effect, partial battle protection, and even forces your opponent to take the battle damage. But I think Relinquished is actually too easy to bring out to be a proper boss monster. This card is the easiest old school ritual to bring out with Dark Illusion Ritual and any other monster. Still a minus two in card advantage, but is usually able to make up for one of those cards with its removal effect. Unfortunately, depending on board state, Relinquished is not necessarily the strongest threat. The other fusion monster I want to mention in the era is the ever problematic Last Warrior from Another Planet, which just flat out prevents summoning, an effect which is extremely resilient to power creep. Fortunately, the card has always been too awkward for widespread play. That board wipe into preventing summoning means establishing a board on top of Last Warrior is very difficult, and the Last Warrior does not have any inherent protection against spells or traps, giving your opponent a couple avenues to deal with the threat while you yourself are unable to further develop your board. 
Maybe there is some cheese with Book of Eclipse, but I want to digress back to rituals for a moment. Demise King of Armageddon is another board wiper, this time symmetric. This gives the card an immediate impact, especially when it had the ignition effect priority. This is not quite on the same level as Inherent Protection, but I would argue that dealing with threats proactively is on a similar level of impact. Mainly, the card was responsible for enabling OTKs, which does in part detract from its potential for boss status. Going in a different direction, I want to point out two other main deck monsters. Ones which are potentially strong, but are way too much effort to bring out. Fusio Ricci has some inherent protection, decent stats, and even recurring card advantage by special summoning zombies from grave each round. The problem is bringing it out though, which requires Great Dizard, a relatively weak one tribute monster, which then needs to destroy two monsters by battle. Interestingly, Great Dizard also gets that partial targeting immunity after destroying the first monster, but this is still too many hoops. The other old school boss monster I want to mention is Exodia Necros, which is close to the first quote unquote unkillable boss monster. It is immune to destruction from spells, traps, and by battle. If you want to be technical, the card can still be targeted, affected by spell traps and monster effects, banished, bounced, or spun by spells and traps, destroyed by monster effects, and even has a unique Achilles heel. All five parts of Exodia must remain in the graveyard, otherwise Necros is destroyed. Hilariously, this makes Disappear an out to the boss monster. You know your card is bad when Disappear is looking like a decent card. But on the other side, Necros does have pretty good inherent protection for the time, and gradually becomes more threatening as it gains 500 attack points each round. Although, starting with 1800 attack is pitiful. I also find it funny that Contract with Exodia is like a backup plan for if your Exodia pieces get discarded, but Backup Soldier is a better backup plan, since that one card can recover most of the pieces. Dark Factory of Mass Production and later Dark Eruption are also pretty good insurance policies. We have covered a lot of precursor boss monsters already, and I am even trimming a few boss monsters like Five-Headed Dragon and Dark Paladin for expediency, as well as the odd dozen structure deck boss monsters released up until this point in the game, since I am saving those for later. But there is one more proto-boss I think is worth mentioning. The creator likewise has summoning restrictions since it cannot be reanimated from grave. You can notably special summon it from hand, like with the creator incarnate, or from the banished zone with DDR, different dimension reincarnation of redundancy. There is no inherent protection, but the impact is near immediate with that reanimation effect, although once per turn and at the cost of a discard. I find this small summoning restriction to be fascinating as it does hamper the potential for the card, but did not prevent it from reaching competitive success entirely. And at this point, I think we have most of the pieces to construct the effects of Light and Darkness Dragon. First effect, cannot be special summoned. This necessitates the tribute summon, although this can be made easier with Kaiser Seahorse. Still, this makes the card very hard to cheat out. A big improvement over the faux restrictions on the negation trio or the partial restriction on the creator. Second effect, while face up on the field, this card is also dark attribute. This effect is very flavorful, but does not really impact the card's functionality. Perhaps it is there as a portent for something to come in the future. Third effect, once per chain, during either player's turn, when a spell card, trap card, or monster effect is activated, this card loses exactly 500 attack and defense, and that activation is negated. This is the negation effect, which is better than anything we have mentioned before, but still has vulnerabilities, and notably a cost, limiting the number of activations. The effect is symmetric, and this monster will run out of negates at some point. Then there is the final effect for insurance. When this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, target one monster in your graveyard, if possible, destroy all cards you control, also special summon that monster, if any. Lad asks for two tributes 
and refunds you with a monster from grave when a suitable target is available. This sort of reminds me of the last warrior from another planet, or maybe how Demise wipes your board safer itself. And we can see all the pieces starting to come together. A relatively high cost to bring out the monster, a strong field presence with inherent protection, some exploitable weaknesses so the card is not too oppressive, and finally, a bonus and a little insurance. Although in terms of card economy, the deductible might be a little high. All in all, I think this constitutes, to me at least, the first proper boss monster in the game. An area of design space which undoubtedly will be explored in future sets, for better or worse.